All right. Hello again. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm the worship pastor here. Uh, if we don't know each other and we haven't met, I'd love to, love to meet you, say hi, get to know you a little bit. Um, but we're in week three of a sermon series that uh, we think is really important. Uh, it's called Identity in Christ. And we're focusing a lot of, on a lot of the stuff that um, is kind of under the surface, that a lot of times as Christian, we just say, oh yeah, like of course I'm this, of course I believe that. Um, but we're sitting with the kind of things that, you know, we're always on a journey in, that you never fully arrive at, and you're always in process of becoming more like Jesus and more fully forming your identity around him, right? I, I certainly don't think I've arrived, and I think we could all identify areas where we still want to um, see ourselves as more um, rooted in, in Jesus and in, in the gospel. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, being secure in Christ. I'm secure in Christ. And I think this is an important thing to talk about um, because kind of the inverse fear of being secure in Christ is being af- afraid that you're not secure in Christ, right? And that can take a lot of forms, but I think the, the form that it most commonly takes is it takes on the fear of God's verdict, his judgment being, man, you're not enough. Or, man, you messed up a lot of times. You made a lot of mistakes. I know that I have made a lot of mistakes, messed up a lot of times. And I've had moments where I've been rooted in a place of fear. I've been rooted in not a place of security where I've felt like, man, I don't feel close to Jesus. I don't, I don't feel confident that I'm accepted by him, secure in him. And I think the scriptures uh, flesh this out in a very particular way that we're going to spend some time in this morning. Um, you'll notice earlier I used um, kind of some legal verbiage um, of verdict and, and judgment, and I think a lot of us, if we're honest, we have this fear of, man, I, I, the thought of God's judgment or standing before the judgment seat of the Lord, as we sometimes say, that sounds scary. And that comes from a place of not being secure. So today we're going to talk about some of this legal language that we use all the time in, and maybe don't even realize it in the church. Um, verbiage like, like judgment, like redemption, like condemnation or to condemn. Uh, an accusation, a charge, a justification, a testimony. We, we use all these words all the time. And they all, um, especially at the time when, when the scriptures were written, um, they come from a very specific context, which is um, a legal context. And um, there's a tradition of seeing God um, in the scriptures as judge, which is a really good thing and something that the scriptures celebrate because God is a just judge. And he's a good judge. And we can trust that what he says is good is good. And so we're going to take a journey through three different, um, what we would call a courtroom scene of God in the Old Testament, where uh, one of the prophets has a vision, and they see God seated on his judgment throne in heaven. So we're going to look at a couple of these, the first one being from Daniel 7. And this is kind of a, a classic Um, really important uh, scene. So Daniel has this vision and he says, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days, that's that's God, took his seat. Uh, His clothing was as white as snow. The hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and his wheels were all ablaze. And then it goes on to say, a river of fire was flowing coming out from before him, thousands upon thousands attended him. That's the heavenly host that we were talking about earlier in Come Thou Fount. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So this is a scene of, that Daniel sees in the heavens and he sees God sitting down like a judge at a podium. I don't know if there's a better term than podium for that. Um, but sitting down and he's about to hold court and he's gonna open this book um, that has... Um, God's knowledge of everything in it, and God is going to render just judgment. Um, so that's kind of a classic 
scene of what we call like a throne room judgment scene in the Old Testament. So we're going to look at two more. And in these other two, there's another character in the story, in, in, in the scene. And that character, uh, depending on what translation of the Old Testament you're reading, will either call this character the accuser or Satan. Now, there's a reason for that, and that's because the Hebrew word that means accuser is Satan. That's where we get our word Satan. Satan means one who accuses or one who opposes. So we're going to see this accuser figure show up in God's courtroom, and he's going to bring an accusation against the people of God. He's going to say, you're not secure in your relationship with God. You're guilty. You're stained. So we're going to look at a couple examples of this. The first one is in chapter one of Job. It goes like this. Um, one day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and the Satan, I'm going to keep saying it that way just to remind us that he's the accuser. The Satan also came with them. The Lord said to the Satan, where have you come from? And the Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to the Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then here's where the Satan, he starts to live into his function as the accuser. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? The Satan replied, he says, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to the Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And the Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So you can see the Satan living in to his identity as the accuser. God's like celebrating his, this faithful man, Job, right? Saying, he's righteous. He does what's pleasing to me. He's loyal. He's a good man. And the accuser says, but is he? Doesn't he love you because you bless him? And if you took away your blessing, wouldn't he curse you? Instead of be faithful to you, he's accusing and doubting the character of Job. Let's look at one more example of this where the, the Satan, the accuser, has the exact same function. Uh, it comes in Zechariah 3. And again, this is a vision that the prophet Zechariah has. And this uh, angel is uh, showing him around this, this heavenly courtroom scene. So then the angel showed Zechariah Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and the Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. So a double rebuke from the Lord there before the accuser can even open his mouth. The Lord is already saying, uh, none of that. And then he goes on to say, it's not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire, which is a way of talking about his holiness been purified. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. He's dirty, he's stained as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin. I have put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with the angel of the, while the angel of the Lord stood nearby. So again, we have this little courtroom scene where the high priest, he's in dirty clothes. And that's the way of talking about, he's not been perfect. He's messed up. He's made mistakes. And the accuser is right there. He's ready to point all of it out. To say, he's not worthy. God, even your high priest is dirty and messed up made mistakes. And the Lord rebukes him. He says, no, I have a new set of clothes for you. I have a clean set of clothes for you that tell a different story, that say that you're righteous, that you're clean. 
that you're enough. See, the kind of things that the Satan or the accuser wants to say is that you don't have the right to do something significant for God. Or you don't have the right to lead somebody to Jesus because of what you've done. You don't have the right to feel like you have a close relationship with God because of all the mistakes you made. The Satan will say things like you're disqualified or unfit or disentitled. You're too far gone. You're second tier. The Satan will say things like you're not good enough because you did blank. Has anybody felt that way? Has anybody had that voice in their head and that pit in your stomach? Man, I don't know if I'm good enough. So I really dropped the ball. And the Satan will say things like, once you do fill in the blank, there's no way back to God. That's what the accuser says about Job, about Joshua the high priest, and what he wants to say to you and me. Um, I have a story about a time when, when I felt this way. Uh, when I was 17, I finished high school a little early and uh, kind of put all my eggs in one basket and, and moved to Colorado. My family lived in Wisconsin, and I attended this internship there. And it was, it was a very strict inter- internship, had a lot of strict rules. Um, and like a lot of silly 17-year-olds do, I ran around and broke the rules and thought I wouldn't get caught. I got caught. Um, I got caught. And if there had been justice, a 17-year-old kid who had moved halfway across the country, who had kind of said, this is what I'm doing, I would have been kicked right out. I would have been sent home. Done. And I felt disqualified. I felt like I'd blown it. I felt like I wasn't enough. Like, well, I'll have to figure something else out to do now because here goes my, my goal of, you know, maybe doing something in the church. And so I, I had this meeting with, with the, the main pastor there who was um, very much like a father figure to me. And um, I'm not going to tell you how the story ends just yet, um, but we'll circle back to it later. That's a time when, when I felt that way, when, when that voice of, of the accuser, of the Satan, was telling me a certain set of truths, a certain story. That felt really real. That felt valid because of what I had done. But here's the good news. The good news is that Jesus has done something about this situation, about this accuser figure who is in the heavens, in the courtroom of God, saying, your people aren't good enough. Your, your priest is, is dirty and filthy. And your people don't actually love you. They just love the things you give them. And Jesus has thrown that accuser out of the courtroom of God. And the New Testament authors, they pick up these, these three um, kind of courtroom scenes that we just read about from Daniel, from Job, from Zechariah, they knew about all these because that was the Old Testament was their Bible, right? They were going to write the New Testament. They didn't have it yet. So their scriptures was, was the Old Testament. And they loved the Old Testament. They connected with God in it, and they knew it like the back of their hands. And so when the New Testament authors, they're writing, there's all kinds of links and allusions back to the Old Testament because that was what they knew. That was what they immersed themselves in and grew up memorizing. Anyway, so Luke 10 um, Chapter 10 of Luke actually picks up on these ideas. Now, in chapter 10 of Luke, um, Jesus is uh, sending out 72 followers of his, and they come back and they're all excited because Jesus sent them out to, to bring the kingdom of God, to bring healing, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, that everyone can be made new through life in Jesus. He, he sends them out to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. And the 72, they come back, they're all excited. And, and they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And what Jesus says to them is, I saw the Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It sounds dramatic, right? And then he goes on to say this, behold, I have given you authority 
to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. So here's what's going on here. When Jesus arrives and the kingdom of God comes in power, and with what Jesus is about to do, and we're going to get into more of that in just a minute, the accusation of the enemy loses its power. And Satan, the the accuser, is kicked out of the courtroom of God. He falls like lightning from the heavens. Um, Now, a quick note on the whole uh, scorpions and serpents thing from the last verse that probably sounded weird. Um, That is the primary way that the biblical authors talk about uh, big picture evil and chaos, things that are opposed to God. I think like the snake in the garden and things like that. Um, So some traditions in the church have said like, oh, well, maybe we should go like, you know, play with poisonous reptiles then, you know, like there's a real thing and they end up usually dying. So uh, that's not what this is about. Don't go and play with with poisonous things. Um, It's just talking about having the authority to overcome evil. Um, Moving on to another passage in the New Testament that picks up on these courtroom scenes of God and what Jesus does to these accusations brought against the people of God. Uh, Revelation 12. And notice again, um, kind of like the different reptile words used, and notice especially it, uh, John, uh, the author of Revelation, uses some terms that link us to the, the snake in Genesis 3 um, with Adam and Eve in some cool ways. So check this out. And the great dragon was thrown down. That sounds kind of like what we just read, right? About Satan falling like lightning. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and the Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And it goes on to say, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Why is that? For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him. How? By the blood of the lamb. By the blood of the lamb. So the authority of the kingdom of God and the conquering of the accuser who brings accusations against the people of God comes by what? Talk to me. Comes by what? The blood of the lamb and by the word of their, notice the legal language again that we talked about earlier, testimony. For they did not love their lives, even unto death. See, that's the economy of the kingdom of God, isn't it? Where do power and authority come from in the kingdom of Jesus? Does it come from being big and strong and exerting your will over others? Does it come from having money or high socioeconomical status? No. It comes from sacrificial love. Power and authority in the kingdom of God look like Jesus on the cross. And when his church loves not their lives even unto death, the authority that comes from that by the power of Jesus and his authority in his death and resurrection. Now that's the kind of power that can take the accusations brought against the people of God and just like maybe me in the internship, right out of the courtroom of God. See, the arrival of the kingdom of God in the incarnation ministry, in the death, the sacrificial love and resurrection of Jesus has thrown down cosmic evil and made baseless the legal accusations of the accuser of Satan against the people of God. So that's amazing and that's beautiful, but it sounds kind of like abstract, doesn't it? Like, okay, we're talking about cosmic evil. We're talking about all these things. Um, let's, let's get a little more personal. Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, there's some cool places in the New Testament where um, this language and, and these ideas continue to be used. 
um, in ways that might, might hit home a little more. But hopefully now we have kind of a big picture and we'll be able to track with Paul here as Paul sets up a courtroom of his own in Romans 8. Um, so if you're following along with the, with the book that we're reading together um, called Identity in Christ, um, the chapter we're in actually uses this text. Um, and I think it's a great text to use for it. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it here as well. But I encourage you to follow along in the book as well. Uh, I think there's still a whole bunch of them out uh, by the front doors. So uh, let's, let's read some, some passages here from, from Romans 8 and let's notice all of this kind of legal language that Paul continues to use. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then a little later he, in the chapter, he goes on to say, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he says, continuing with, the, with um, really the same themes from Revelation, the sacrificial cross-shaped love, right? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge or accusation, we might say, against God's elect, against the church. For it is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Who's gonna bring a condemnation against the people of God? Because Christ Jesus is the one who died and more than that was raised. Who's at the right hand of God who's interceding for us? Do you see what Paul's doing there? He's taking those same categories and ideas from Revelation of the power and authority that comes from the cross-shaped, sacrificial love of Jesus. He says, that changed everything. These accusations that were brought against us, this condemnation that we can live in fear of, this feeling of insecurity in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus has done the most dramatic thing I can think of to do something about that. I can't think of something that says you're secure with me and I'll do anything for you more than the cross. And so Paul widens the scope beyond just this kind of Old Testament figure of, of the accuser in, before the throne room of God. He widens it to all of creation. So he goes right on the very next verse, verse 35. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And he goes on and widens the scope even more. He says, for I am sure, he's sure, that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, Joshua the high priest standing before God in his, his filthy clothes and the accuser standing right there to accuse him. That is not the greatest reality. That is not the story that Jesus invites us into. The story that Jesus invites us into is by the power of my death and resurrection, you are clean and you are new. And there is no one that can say that you are condemned, that you're accused, that you're not enough, that you're guilty, that you have to be separated from me. I have one example from the Gospels that, uh, man, it, it just, it hits home in my heart in a, in a way that um, I hope it will for you too. Um, there's a, a story in, in John 8 where Jesus uh, gets put in this kind of crazy situation. The, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they bring a woman to him who's been caught in adultery. Um, now, Presumably, there also would have been a man who was caught in adultery, but they don't seem interested in bringing uh, him to be held accountable, just the woman, but that's maybe a, 
another sermon for another time, but um, <laughs> soapbox. Um, they bring this woman to Jesus. And you guys know the story, right? They say, are you going to accuse her, Jesus? Are you gonna tell us to stone her? Because that was, that was what the law of Moses prescribed. And Jesus says, hey, whichever one of you has never sinned, has perfectly clean clothes, you go ahead and you toss the first stone. And they all walk away. After they walk away, Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Or other translations will say, where are your accusers? And she said, no one, sir. Then he said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. See, for Jesus, mercy triumphs over judgment, doesn't it? See, the Pharisees, they're acting as the Satan in this scenario, right? They're acting as the accusers, and they're trying to get Jesus to do that too. They're saying, Jesus, accuse her, condemn her, tell her she's guilty. Jesus says, I'd rather forgive her. He says, I'd rather forgive her. I'd rather tell her she's enough. I'm gonna tell her to go and sin no more. But there's mercy. So I think this is a really good question to ask ourselves. Where are your accusers? I can think of a lot of places where it could come from. I think a lot of us have people in our lives. That's a friend, coworker, or family member who probably not really blatantly, but maybe subtly, maybe sarcastically, passive aggressively, will say things that make you feel condemned. Make you feel like you're not enough, that you're guilty, that you're second tier. might be a narrative you hear from your TV, from your talk radio, from your social media. I think those things can often encourage comparison and make you feel like you're second class in comparison to the people who only show you the good parts of their lives on TV and the internet. But I think for a lot of us, it's probably ourselves, if we're being honest. it's really easy to say to somebody else when when somebody else has made a mistake or or feeling like, man, I just, I don't feel like I'm enough. I feel like I'm condemned. I feel guilty. We say, oh no, there's grace. There's forgiveness. Jesus loves you. He forgives you. But when we mess up, is that the story that we tell ourselves? Or do we say things to ourselves that we would never say to somebody else? Are we our own accuser? Even on a subconscious level. You know, maybe you're not, you know, I'm gonna sit down for five minutes and tell myself all these things, but subconsciously, it's the way you think, the things that you tell yourself say, I'm condemned, I'm guilty. I'm like Joshua the high priest standing before God's judgment and I'm in dirty clothes. I'm messed up. God wouldn't want to use me. Or maybe he does, but he wouldn't want to use me as much as that person over there, right? I think that a lot of us struggle with that. And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about, identity in Christ. That's under the surface, that we don't talk about super often, that we just assume that we all have ironed out. And I think we're all in process with it. I think we all have room to grow in it. And uh, I'm going to show you a clip from a movie that I like a lot uh, called Luca that I think is going to give us a little way to remember some of this. Um, the, the words are a little quiet, but the words are also on the screen. So try to, try to pick it up and we'll, we'll watch that together. 
Okay, great clip, huh? The turtle's my favorite. Um, <laughs> you catch what uh, the one kid said to, to the other. He said, you've got a Bruno in your head. You got a Bruno in your head. And I think a lot of us, maybe not all the time, but in moments, maybe we have a Bruno in our head. Maybe we have this cycle on repeat that's telling us a set of statements and immersing us in a story that's not true. That's not the reality that Jesus has invited us into. And I think that what we need to do to that cycle of thoughts, that you're condemned, you're guilty, you're not enough, you're second tier, is to say exactly what they yelled back and forth at each other, silencio Bruno. That's not the story that I'm living in. That's not the reality I've been invited into. The reality I've been invited into is I'm enough. I'm secure that the accusations that I might tell myself or that might come against me from anywhere, Jesus says, that's not what I've said about you. That's not what the power of the cross has done for you. So, for some of us, it's going to be catching that cycle of, of thinking. Catching that Bruno in your head and saying, mm, that's not how I'm going to think. I'm going to catch that. And I'm going to tell myself this story instead. I'm going to tell myself what the gospel says is true about me. And for some of us, it's going to be doing what Jesus does for the woman caught in adultery. Someone who's feeling condemned, feeling dirty, feeling like they screwed up. And being the voice of Jesus in that moment saying, where are your accusers? Jesus doesn't condemn you. I don't condemn you. You can be that voice to somebody else. Maybe you've even been actively holding that from somebody. Holding a grudge. Holding unforgiveness. So for some of us, it's going to be stepping into that situation saying, you know, what I've been holding against this person, Jesus isn't holding that against that person. So what right do I have to do that? Why would I do that if Jesus doesn't? Maybe you can do that for somebody. You should pray with me. God, we're thankful for the gospel reality that you've invited us into. That you've invited us into security, into confidence, into trust, into hope. Because you did the hard, painful, sacrificial, loving work of silencing what would accuse and condemn. We celebrate this morning our worst moments, our greatest mistakes and failures could never separate us from your love. When you see us in our moments of failure, our moments of sin, what you say is, get my child some clean clothes. We thank you that there's no condemnation, there's no accusation in you. Help us to believe that for ourselves, 
at a deeper level? And help us to believe that that is also a reality for every other person. And to extend that same kind of mercy and forgiveness and security to those around us. Help us to do that by the power of your spirit. Amen. So I have this meeting with uh, this pastor. If we could get the lights back up a little bit. Um, thanks, man. Um, I have this meeting with, with the pastors leading the internship. And here's the 17-year-old kid who grew up in a house full of abuse and condemnation and accusation. A kid who never felt like he was enough, never felt secure, who always felt like he had to earn and perform to be okay, and to be accepted. That was me. And this pastor looks at me and he says, there's mercy here. I forgive you. And we're gonna grow together. And for a father figure to say that to me, it changed my life. It changed the story that I lived in. I hope that you can do that for somebody too. Um, as you go today, be salt, be light. Bring the kingdom and the love of Jesus with you. Um, there's invite cards by every door. Grab a couple on your way out if you don't already have a couple. And ask, who needs to be a part of a life-giving community, of a community that's in relationship with Jesus? Go out on a limb. Invite him. Ask him to come with you. Come and worship with you. You never know how God might use that. It might change somebody's life. Go in peace.